Hello, my name is Caleb Smith, coming to you from the Rocket Miner Archives with a news update for September 9th, 2020. Um, why are we in the archives? There's a reason for that. We're going to be looking at a centennial celebration. But first, let's just talk about the little bit more recent news of the uh, continuing cleanup of um, around Sweetwater County uh, following our batch of storms. Rocky Mountain Power reports that it is continuing to have crews work nonstop to restore service. Um, according to Rocky Mountain Power's um, outage safety map, which you can find at rockymountainpower.net, um, right now we have about 1,200 people who are still without power. Um, the, the company notes that um, there was quite extensive damage following um, hurricane strength winds um, in excess of 110 miles per hour. And every so often you do spot check this stuff. According to the National Weather Service, um, if you, when you're looking at the um, Sapphire Simpson hurricane wind scale, uh, type 2 hurricane um, does go up to 110 miles per hour. And they warn that um, winds that fast um, will cause extensive damage which tracks with what we've seen lately. Notes that um, as of this afternoon, there had been um, about 96,000 customers without power in Utah, Idaho, and Rock Springs. Um, as of that update, there were about 2,000 without power in Rock Springs, so I'm glad that we've already improved that number by about, by about 800. Um, I know many people who had a long day yesterday without power. It does note that um, if at this evening, um, if you do not have power at this time, be prepared that this will continue through tonight and into Thursday, uh, given the damage, given the level of damage and the wide area affected. Um, of course, um, Rocky Mountain Power pledges that the workers will continue until um, service to all customers is restored. In other news, the University of Wyoming announced that it is continuing to pause um, when it comes to in-person classes. Um, they switched to online only um, last week on S September 2nd. According to the plan approved by the University of Wyoming uh, Board of Trustees, um, whenever five or more people, uh, students, staff, uh, tested positive for the, corona, uh, for, uh, the coronavirus in a single day, that meant that they would um, pause in-person learning for five business days. Um, today, the university announced that th this pause is going to continue until at least Monday. The idea is that they want to see, um, gather more evidence about the current levels of infection on staff, and also they're looking to see what impact uh, might come out of the Labor Day weekend. Yeah, uh, Wyoming Governor Mark Gordon um, had s similar comments at his press conference today. Um, he expressed uh, optimism that they're hopeful that uh, when the current health orders, which are extending through uh, at least September 15th, they're hoping to be able to roll back some when we get to that date. They stress that especially they want to see a combination of two things. They want to see um, where numbers are coming out of the Labor Day weekend. Uh, Wyoming, like most places, saw uh, a spike in cases after July 4th weekend. Governor says that he, he's hopeful that people practice good distancing, wearing face masks when they could not do so, in addition to, like I said, good cleanliness across the board, washing hands and whatnot. And that um, that coupled with the return to school, which we anticipated um, that there would be cases of teachers and students being infected, and we were not wrong with that. But the goal is that with distancing guidelines, um, um, state officials today during the press conference noted what uh, one case in a school district where, yes, student um, came to school, but because of the protocols that were in place, from what they can tell, nobody else um, contracted the coronavirus. That's one of those things that why we keep stressing masks and whatnot. This is about good defense. Um, if you're exposed, we don't want to um, give another notch to the coronavirus. And so hopefully we'll be able to get through this period and 
Um, something that's been stressed by school districts, governor, um, state officials, and whatnot is that the better that we um, are protecting ourselves and one another, the sooner we can lessen some restrictions. Governor Gordon um, repeated something he said often is that the idea is to do this slowly and not to have to backtrack. It's discouraging to people. It's damaging to businesses when you when you put all the time and money into reopening something or expanding a number of people there, and then you have to roll it back. That takes an impact on people, um, emotionally, uh, financially. And the hope is that we be um, good cowboys, good cowgirls, be respectful to our neighbors as we go forward. One last thing I'd like to know is that the... Um, um, there's going to be a centennial flight touching down at the Southwest Wyoming Regional Airport in Rock Springs tomorrow. A um, hundred years ago, the U.S. Postal Service started a um, transcontinental airmail system. Um, keep in mind, we've um, at that point, um, airplanes had not been around for very long. Um, seen a limited use in World War I, and commercial flights were, were still limited, and this was the beginning of um, the idea is that it took 16 airfields if you took the maximum um, um, course from the eastmost point all the way to the west point, uh, west, westernmost point. And as part of that, there will be a commemorative flight um, retracing the, the original U.S. airmail route. Um, the transfer of mail is supposed to take place between 9.30 to 10 a.m. in front of the Sweetwater Aviation Hangar. And the reason why we're in the archives is that I was just trying to figure out what was the newspaper's coverage back then. And this was when we still had a Rock, um, a rock Springs Miner and a Rocket Paper. They were both separate. And I'm just pulling from the... Um, this is a copy of the... 1920 rocket miner and spring and it, it's uh, it notes that the first week of um, aerial flights were um, came with some rockiness um, particularly um, on so Monday right after they it's um, they'd only had a handful of flights uh, as of September 10th 1920. Only seven cross-country flights have gone through, but on that, on one morning, there was um, flight number 104. The pilot had lost his way and passed south of the city of Rock Springs, continuing west for a number of miles. Discovering his mistake, the pilot returned, but, and a lack of gas made necessary his landing before he had reached the field. He crashed. Um... It notes that the crash took place near the wool warehouse in the north part of town, and an examination showed that there was not a drop remaining in the tank of 104. Um, it's one of those things where it's still early in the route, people were learning things. And I should also note that it's in, um, we should remember that aviation was still in its infancy, and it was inherently d dangerous. I dug a little bit deeper and was surprised to find that there was an update just one week later. And this one's a lot less funny. It's the headline is or the headline from the September 17th edition of the Rock Springs Miner reads Veteran Flyer Meets Death in Burning Plane. Dateline Cleveland, Ohio. Um, three days before, September 14th. Airmail pilot Walker Stevens and and um Mechanician um, Russell Thomas, both of Cleveland, were burned to death at 3 o'clock today when their plane caught fire at an altitude of 500 feet at Pemberton, Ohio, 15 miles south of, of Toledo. Stevens and Thomas were flying a Cross JL all-metal monoplane. They left here at 12.20 p.m. for Chicago with 400 pounds of mail, which they were rel relaying after an accident in which a mail plane was wrecked here today, and pilot w Riddleberger slightly injured shortly after taking off. So that wasn't even the first crash just on this specific mail run. Oh, continuing. 
Um, Stevens was a veteran of the airmail service, having been a member since its inauguration. He came here from Crosswell, Michigan. Before departing today, he told friends at his flying field that this would be his last trip as he had resigned. Thomas leaves a, leaves a bride of four days. Um, and the story actually includes uh, um, a local update, which is something we try to do ourselves to this day. We sometimes take a wire story, um, add local input, perspective, context to it. And says, Mr. Stevens will be remembered by many Rock Springs people as the pilot who overshot his land landing here on Saturday, September 4th, and partly wrecked plane number 152, just east of here. Or just east of the landing field. On the trip here, Mr. Stevens was accompanied by his pet dog, and first thought when he stopped from... Or it's, and first thought... And his first thought when he stepped from the plane was of the dog. After his accident here, Mr. Stevens remained in Rock Springs for several days when he was ordered to New York to take the plane west. He was unable to take his dog with him to New York and expected to pick him up on the return trip. The dog is now being cared for by a fr friend in this city. Before leaving Rock Springs, Mr. Stevens stated that he would not fly during the winter but would make his way home in San Francisco until spring and he was making one more trip before returning. We're lucky today. There, it's easy to forget that some things we take for granted, they've worked out the kinks. Some things still still need work. That's just the nature of the beast, nature of the machine, nature of the job. Sometimes, like I said, if you have the chance, you have some free time. Um, like I said, the Centennial flight will be touching down in Rock Springs tomorrow morning. You can see more details both about the um, the transcontinental air route. And some of the details of the um, commemoration tomorrow at rocketminer.com. This is Caleb Smith wishing you a good day and a safe tomorrow.